Hello and welcome everybody to week 10 of Fast Book Reading Group. And um, this week we're taking a, a break from computer vision, although everything's going to look very similar. But uh, by the time we finish today, we would have built a movie recommendation system. And you will see how Fast AI makes things really easy for non computer vision stuff. Like we saw it in chapter one, where, where we were looking at different examples of NLP, we were looking at examples of um, various different things that's non computer vision, like tabular. Um, but then today we're going to actually spend some time looking at um, movie recommendation using Fast AI. Particularly, this, this type of a problem is called collaborative filtering. And uh, as part of the solving this problem, we're going to look at things like what's an embedding. Um, so that's the main idea. And uh, one second, sorry, it looks like this. Okay, there we go. Um, and then, so just like every week, uh, if you go to that link, onedb.me slash fastbook10, so let me go there, onedb.me slash fastbook10. Uh, that should take me into this fastbook reading group week 10. And this is where we'll post all our comments just like every week. So let me just post a comment here. And there we go. Um, so as you, as you go through the session, if you have any questions about uh, what we're doing or you know, if there's anything you want to say to me, just put your comment here and same as usual. Um, so that's fast with week 10. Um, this week has been really good in terms of blog posts as well. I saw some really good blog posts and Akash has come back this week and he's finished his blog post on lost functions part two. So I was giving a read, actually this is a nice blog post. Uh, if I can find it, let's see, uh, loss functions part two. Loss functions part two. I hope this shows up because I'll have to otherwise go into it and find. Oh, there we go. Let's hope it's this one. Is it? Uh, is it? Is it that? Kashmir.github.io. Yeah, there we go. We found it. Loss functions part two. So the thing that I really liked about this blog post is um. A lot of the different losses that we generally use, like mean square error, uh, mean absolute error loss, and you know, pretty much all the different losses that you'll see have been plotted, but also their code has been shown. Uh, just so it's like a really nice collation of bringing lots of different things together. Uh, so I think I would I would do recommend I do recommend everybody uh, to give this blog post a read. So thanks Akash for sharing that. Um, Ferris, uh, thanks come for coming again and writing about mix up. Actually, this was again. Another wonderful blog post. So let me bring that up. Uh, Ferris, actually that's about mix up. So I really like the, I think Ferris has gone in and he's explained the mix up paper. I do want to show you, but I've made the mistake of not keeping the URLs handy. So I'll have to go in like Ferris. I have to go in like this, which is very manual. I should have kept the URLs handy. Let's see if somebody's posted that in the chat. Oh, there we go. Um, thanks, Angelica. Okay, uh, so where's the mix up? Here it is. That's mix up. Um, so I just want to bring up mix up, and again, this is this is really a well written blog post. I think because when we were discussing mix up and we were discussing these ideas last week, I did sort of mention that it would make a good blog post to write about mix up. And you can see how there's this example, then you can see the official implementation and you can see how these uh, different tenses look like. You can see what the mix up loss looks like. And finally you can see the fast AI implementation. So I really like these kind of blog posts that bring uh, code and explanation together. And I, I feel like then it's really this one place that puts uh, everything uh, at a single place, so the reader doesn't really have to look at multiple places when they're trying to understand mix up. Um, Ravi's come back, he's written about chapter seven. Um, so there's normalization, progressive resizing, pretty much all the tricks. And he's also been able to get 88.5% accuracy. So I believe that's a 0.7% jump uh, from last week. So through these tricks, he's been able to get a 0.7% jump. And uh, I believe then. I will go to that uh, forum post as well, uh, just to see what everybody's been doing with cassava and how that's different from last week. And then Ravi Chandra has come back and he's written about his learnings from chapter seven as well. So thanks guys for doing this week after week. There's also a recap of chapter six. 
Uh, Korean has come back and he's, I think he just wrote this as of 20 minutes ago, which is about uh, the various different uh, difference between cross entropy and binary cross entropy. Actually, I'm really interested, but uh, due to time, I didn't get a chance to read this blog post. So I will go back and read this, but thanks Korean for, for sharing your blog with us. Miyazi has been his, I still remember my first time when uh, the fast book arrived at my place and I was really excited to see fast book. And that's what has happened. That kind of moment has happened with him as well. Uh, so my fast book has arrived and then you can see how uh, he's also written this blog post about chapter six. So thanks for doing that. And finally, if we have Anand, Anand has also written about chapter six. So a few people playing catch up, uh, but that's great to see that you guys uh, are still doing, are still motivated to continue and you know keeping up with uh, with the fast book reading group. So one thing I do uh, feel excited is that this is the tenth week, and usually what I've seen with events is the interaction kind of goes down by the time we hit the fifth week or the fourth week. But something I'm seeing with Fastbook and something that really makes me very happy and makes me really excited is that all of us have, have been together and we've been doing Fastbook week after week. And we've been covering all of these different, uh, we've been covering all of these different topics and we, we're still going strong. So I'm really happy for, for the outcome week 10. I'm um, having said that, we are going to start with fast book chapter chapter eight, which is collab. Um, so then let me get straight into it. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Can you guys please post in the chat just to maybe quick yes or no that you can see my screen? Um, and if the Zoom levels are okay. All right. Um, so then let's start with collaborative blueprint. So let me bring up one note. So we can go to fast book. And that's it. And we can say add section, call it chapter, chapter eight. All right, we're all set. Cool. So what is collaborative filtering? I think uh, it really makes sense to read this introduction uh, line by line. Uh, so let's start with that. So one very pro common problem that you'll that, that's out there to be solved is this problem is uh, when you have a number of users and you have a number of products, then what you really want to do is you want to match the users to the products, right? What you want to say is, oh, this user might like this particular product or this product. Uh, user won't like this particular product, so we shouldn't spend time marketing it to that user. Or like you want to find a group of users, you have a new product, and then you want to find a group of users. And you, uh, so it's like a marketing campaign. And then you want to find a small group of users that you feel is like the most apt for a particular kind of product. So I guess these are all uh, problems of the same kind. They're all collaborative filtering kind of problems. And we see these problems, but different uh, variations of it like Netflix. So when we see movie recommendation, that's again a kind of a problem where we're trying to match the users to the product. So the product here becomes the various movies, and then the user is the user base. And then we can see uh, other things like what do you want to highlight on a home page? Uh, deciding what stories to show in social media feeds, pretty much like recommendation system. So that's what we're going to cover uh, in our in our session today. And uh, having said that, that's just the, basically the general uh, idea. And what we're going to see is that that's the foundation of this idea is something called latent factors. So what that latent factors means, we're going to have a look at that, but Think of it this way, if we still keep the movie recommendation problem as the main problem that we try to solve today, and then you can sort of expand that to all of these various different domains. But if you think of movie recommendation, then can you think like users have personalities of their own? Like some users might, try, might like action films, some users might like... Uh, yeah, some users might like action films, some users might want to see a musical, some users might want to see classics. So there's like all of these different user preferences. But similarly, 
movies also have their own personalities. Like you have movies that are uh, that are pretty much like you have old movies, you have action packed sci fi movies, and then you could have maybe like yeah, you have all of these different kinds of movies as well. So movies in themselves have a personality, or they have um, yeah. So you can pretty much then the idea what latent factors means in this sense is that you can represent a movie by saying how action packed it is or you can say oh how old it is or you can say how much of a musical it is or you can say um is it going to be likable so there's like all of these different traits that a movie can have so you can represent a movie using latent factors and you can similarly represent a user using latent factors. So I, I hope that's just the general idea that we should keep in mind that everything can be represented as long as we think of it that way. So that's this that's this general idea. Um, so then um, as part of the session today, we're going to be working with the movie lens data. So let me bring that up. Um, so movie lens is just a smaller, so movie lens has like 25 million movie ratings. So pretty much we're not going to work with 25 million, but I'm just going to show you a small part of it. So you can see, we just go, oh, fastai.collab import star, uh, fastai.tableau.import star. So that's just importing stuff. So let me just run that. Uh, next, I can just say, okay, URL start movie lens 100K. So we're going to work with a smaller subset. So we're not going to work with uh, the 25 million uh, movies that we have, but rather we're just going to work with a smaller subset of 100,000 movies. So I can just say path under data URLs dot URLs ML uh, 100K. So then if I have a look at what's in this path, I can just say path.ls. You can see there's like these 23 different uh, pretty much these different items that are there. You can see there's like a ML 100K U dot item. There's UV dot test. There's like all these different files. And if you want to read about them, you can have a look at this uh, movie lens. So like you will know going to the readme or like various different, just understanding the data set would be through here. But as mentioned in Fastbook, according to the readme, the main table in the file is this U dot data. So it's a tab separated. So until now we've looked at CSVs. So what CSV, uh, what's the difference in uh, CS, CSV, which is a comma separated file and a tab separated file is a delimiter. So in tab separated files, you can still use the pandas read CSV function. And you can just say, okay, my delimiter is tab limited. So in that case, if I read this u.data u .data file, you can see that I can read my rating. So I can just go like this and I can say ratings are head. So you can see I can pretty much with the data that I have is uh, I have some user IDs, like users could be pr pretty much names or just numbers. In this case, they are just represented by IDs. So user 196 saw the movie, which is represented by ID 242, and he gave that movie a rating of three. And this is the timestamp. So you can see that the particular user saw that movie at that particular time. So then there's like this massive data set of, let's see how much. The ratings dot shape. You can see it's hundred thousand. So if I go have a look at the tail, again it's going to be the same data. We can see user eight eighty saw this movie four seventy six and gave rating three. This user saw this movie two twenty five and gave rating two. So again, um, looking at this uh, data set in this long format of like a tabular long format is not very helpful. It's not very human friendly. So what would really help is this uh, next cross tab version of looking at things. So you can see how we can represent this same data set just in this way. So you can have all your movie IDs at the top. You can have all your user IDs on your left. And then you can say, okay, user 14 saw movies, 27, 49, 57, and so on. And he gave these, these ratings to that those movies. Uh, user 29, again, gave those ratings and that particular rule. Uh, user 508 gave those particular ratings like 5, 5, 4.0, and so on. User 546 didn't see the movie 27. Therefore, there's an empty space over here. Similarly, for movie, uh, which is the ID 49, without worrying what that movie is, uh, users 212, 293 haven't seen it, so that's just empty. Um, so again, as, as mentioned here in Fastbook, we've just selected a few of the most popular movies. What, what it means by the most popular movies, it means the movies that the most number of people have seen. 
And then we've just selected the users who watch the most movies. So that's just these users who watch the most movies. That's why this, um, that's why this cross tab table is pretty much, there's like very less empty spaces. Or if you think of it as like, it's, it's not sparse at all. But um, one thing that we do, we, we should consider over here is, is like, if I have, one million users and I have, so I just want to quickly highlight this and I have say 10 million movies, right? So that, that in a way is a gigantic table. It's a massive, massive table, right? Can you imagine how much memory this table would need? And then you can see uh, if we just, this is going to be, this table is going to be that massive. And then one thing you will see is like these one point out of these 1 million users, only a very few handful would have seen a very few handful of movies. So like if I go from one to 1 million over here, and then I go from one to hundred million over here, there's going to be a lots of lots and lots of like empty spaces. There's only going to be a few points that are going to be filled. So it's actually going to be this gigantic data uh, is, is actually going to be this gigantic table where lots of that space is going to be empty. So I just want to point that out and, and before we move on. Um, so in this case, this data set is pretty full because, I'm um, sorry, one second. Um, in this case, in this case, what's happening is that because we've just selected the top users and we've just selected the top movie IDs, that's why this data set or this, this table is pretty full. So that's what it says. If we knew for each user to what degree they like each important category, uh, this is just extra stuff that being, that's being mentioned in the book is like, sorry, let's not worry about that. Um, so then let's just go over here. So let's say, this movie last, let's say there's this movie called Last Skywalker. What if I could represent the movie Last Skywalker by three numbers? Again, as I've said, this is the idea of representing a movie by latent factors. And what those latent factors are, they could be genre, age, and preferred doctor. So let's let's read this now. So if we knew for each user to what degree they liked each important category that a movie might fall into, such as genre, age, preferred directors and actors, and so forth, we would know the same information about each movie, then simply we can fill it in this table uh, by using that information. So what that means is, if I go here, if I just pick one particular movie, right? I can represent that by say, one, two, three, four, and five numbers. And what those, what these five numbers could mean is like old, uh, like how old the movie is. So when I say how old the movie is, if, if I'm rating this movie between minus one and one, 1 1.0 being the movie is really, really old, like many, many years old. And then let's say how much action there is. So action is like a 0.5 or we could say how much of a musical it is, and you could say it's minus, point, uh, minus 0 0.7, which means there's not much music in the movie. So I'm just trying to make these like numbers up. But then these things at the top that, that are used to represent a movie are called as latent factors. And then similarly, for each of the users, I could have said, okay, well, what if this user, I can represent my user again, say by, five numbers and I can say the idea of how much does the user like old movies like this particular user so I'm just going to put a, a small diagram over there and I can say this user really likes old movies so that's like one and I'm rating things again this user does not like action movies at all so it's like minus 0.9 and then in terms of musical this user does not like does not like minus does not like musical movies as well. So the score there is 0.7. And then you can see if you want to match, um, then you can see the idea right in front of you. If you want to match a user to a movie, what if you just multiply these two things, like you multiply them between each other? So if old 
this user really likes old movies. This movie is really old, which means the match here is 1.0. This user hates uh, uh, action packed movies, but this movie has about 0.5 action in it, which means it's minus 0.45. So as in a score over here would be minus 0.45, which means that's gonna be a negative score. And then this, this user really doesn't like musical movies, this movie does not have any musicals. So you can see the score is going to be positive. So you can see where every time there's going to be a match between what the user likes and uh, what's present in the movie. In that case, my score is going to be positive. Does that make sense so far? So then I could just add my scores across these various latent factors and I could get a single digit score. And if that score is high, which means that this movie is a good recommendation for this user. So that's just the basic idea. Um, so that's what you'll see when you read this is like, okay, we can represent this movie last Skywalker by just these three numbers. Again, these three numbers could be old, uh, action packed and musical. And then similarly, I could represent my user using three numbers, which is like, okay, uh, does my user really like old movies? Does my user really like action packed movies? Uh, does my user really like musical movies? And then you can see, okay, you can multiply them one and one. So you can multiply this with that and you can just take the sum and you get your score. So that's that, uh, one second. All right, uh, sorry guys, I'll be right back. There's someone at the door, just give me one sec. Sorry, stuff always has to happen uh, when I'm in the middle of something important. Yeah, the work, work from home life, this is it. If I was in a meeting room, this would never have happened. Uh, anyway, um, so then that's where we are. So then you can say how, you can see how uh, we can match movies to users. And then the way we're matching is through these latent factors. Right. Um, so then that way, the score between user one uh, liking this movie, Last Skywalker, is 2.41. While this uh, 2.14, while this number on its own doesn't like it, the it doesn't hold any weight of its own. Like number 2.1 is not something that's important to us. What's important to us is like how high is this number or how low is this number? If this number is negative, which means there's not a good match. And if this number is positive, it means it's a good match, okay? So that's what, uh, that's what this idea is. And then this idea of multiplying two vectors together and adding up the results in uh, deep learning is called as dot product. So this is something we've seen so many times uh, everywhere. Uh, and you finally know now what dot product is. It's just multiplying two arrays and then adding them together. So you can see, on the other hand, we might represent the movie Casablanca like this. And then you can see how the match between now the user is negative. So you can see how you can match users to uh, movies. So then the idea is, so then the idea is, oh, but the computer doesn't know, like we as humans know how good a movie is, or we as humans know how like how much of a classical it is, how much of a musical it is. Like as humans, we can tell those things, but what about a computer? A computer wouldn't know those things. So the idea that comes forward is like, you learn the latent factors. So let me bring that up and show you what that means. Let's just copy paste that. Yeah. Um, so then over here, what could happen is I'm just going to say my movie. So let's say I have, I represent each movie by a vector of, by a vector of length five. So you can see one, two, three, four, five. And I represent each user. So let me use a different color for users. I represent each user by again, a vector of length five, right? Now, what do these mean? 
I could say things like, oh, again, same. Uh, how much of a sci-fi is this? Is represented by these numbers at the top. How much of action is present is represented by these numbers. How much of, uh, I don't know, again, I'll say musical, and then I'll say theater, maybe. Uh, so I'm just going to say the, and then so on. And then maybe this could be sport, how much sport is in the movie. I'm just making these latent factors up. We don't need, need to worry like what they are, but I'm just, just so we all understand, I'm just making these up. And then similarly, the, the latent factors for the users could be like, oh, uh, I'm just going to draw like that. And then I could say, oh, how much does this user like sci-fi movies? How much does this user like action movies? How much does this move, uh, user like musical movies? How much does this user like theater movies? And how much does this user like movies that are related to sport? Um, so we can see like for user 14, we can see the user doesn't really like sci-fi movies because the score is like 0.2. Uh, the score for action is high. So this user really likes action movies. Uh, this user really also likes musical movies. This user doesn't really like theatrical movies. Um, and this user kind of likes sport. Um, so then you can see how that's the preference. And then for uh, sci-fi, you can see like the same, for the movie, you can see like these same things. Uh, so you can, you can pretty much uh, read this for this movie 27. Uh, we can see, oh, this movie is not really anything, has not much to do with sci-fi. This movie is somewhat action-packed. This movie, there is some sort of musical in it. There is quite a bit of theater and there is a lot of sport in that movie. So that's that's how I would read these numbers. Now, uh, now the idea is what we want to do is when we saw this uh, example before, is like, we know this is the, these are the actual user ratings, right? right? We know user 14 gave a rating of three for the movie 27. And the idea for this collaborative filtering is to fill in these gaps. So if we can figure out the gap on like, how much would a user 212 give a rating to the movie 49, uh, 49 then that's, that's, that's what we wanna know. So then that becomes the recommendation. If this number is high, that means, oh, um, we should really recommend this movie to the user. So the idea that we want to do is we can now find the scores. So these are like all the numbers over here. These are scores, right? And how do we find these scores? It's like we multiply these five numbers. So let me use a different color, one second. Um, so we multiply these five numbers. I'm just trying to find uh, maybe a good color. So we multiply these five numbers with these five numbers. Right, And when you multiply these five numbers, you can just add them up. So you'll get a score over here. Similarly, if I multiply these five numbers with the same five numbers at the top, I get this score 4.92. That's by 0 0.79 times 1.69, uh, 0.79 times 1.69, 1.07 times this one and so on. And you multiply that and you get 4.92. So this is the idea, right? So then uh, what I could have done is in this, this is not a very data science, we're not using deep learning at the moment, right? But what if I told you is like, let me just start with a, a fresh image again. Um, so what if I told you all of these numbers could be learned? Like what I could instead do is What I could instead do is like, I start with just these, all these numbers at the top, all of these numbers and all of these numbers for the users, I could just start with random numbers, right? So I could just start with random numbers. I could find the predictions uh, by multiplying these random numbers. Then I could compare these predictions to the actual ground truth that we have. So if I start with a prediction of 3.24 over here, and because I also have the actual ratings, I know user 293 for movie 27, like this movie, like really like this movie, so the score was maybe five, then this way I can calculate the loss and I can actually learn all of these numbers and I can learn all of those numbers. So I can learn these latent factors. Does that make sense? Um, if it doesn't make sense, let me know and like just post uh, in 
the forum. But then this is the main idea behind collaborative filtering or behind movie recommendation. Like you start with some random representations of your users. You start with some random representation of your movies. Then you multiply them within each other. So you have like scores and then you calculate the loss and you can use stochastic gradient descent to, to learn these latent factors at the top. And once you've learned these latent factors, it means that now the computer knows, okay, which movie is which? Does this movie, is this movie action packed? Is this movie full of sport and so on? And it also, the computer already knows or like our deep learning algorithm already knows, oh, this user really likes action movies. This user really likes, uh, this user really likes musical movies and so on. So this is this idea of now being able to mix and match. So as you can see, step one of the approach of like learning the latent factors is step one of the approach is to randomly initialize some parameters. So that's this blue at the top and orange at the bottom. Step two of the approach is to calculate predictions. So that's all of these numbers inside like this 3.12, 4.24 and so on. Uh, step three is to calculate our loss. And once you know in deep learning, once we have calculated the loss, then everything is just straightforward. Then what you can do is you can use stochastic gradient descent. The computer can learn on its own, which is what deep learning is. And we don't need to worry about anything. So we just calculate the loss. We do stochastic gradient descent and we do it over and over and over again, epoch by epoch. So the model would actually learn good representation of my users. The model would actually learn good representation of my movies. And that's it, that's my job done. So if in the future, uh, what I have is like, if I have a gap over here, but because the computer would already know about movie ID 99 and the deep learning algorithm, when I say computer deep learning algorithm, I'm just trying to make things like a, just use a simple language. So the deep learning algorithm would just know about 212 user ID. So I can just match this user with this uh, movie and I can just get my score. I hope that makes sense. Um, so that's the main idea. So I'm just gonna go to check if there's any questions on the main idea so far. But that's just the main idea. After this, it's just code, um, pretty much it's just code. So let's see if there's any questions. All right, how much of the grid uh, needs to be filled out to this uh, type of problem fail? Uh, that's a really good question and it will be covered just uh, in, in some time. Is there any point where you throw out a movie or a user or use the average until a certain point? Let's uh, let's come back to this question. This is a really, really good question, Kevin. Thanks for asking. Do latent factors have to be inferred? Uh, what does that mean? So I have had issues with that in the past. If I'm not an expert in certain domain, I don't watch that many movies. So I may not know why the movies are on different ends of the latent feature scale. Is that point? Is that the point that is important to work with a subject matter expert. I really don't understand, Kevin. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry I don't understand the question. Could you maybe reply to this? Um, as long as you understand like a user can be represented by some numbers, like a vector of five numbers, and then movies could be represented by a vector of five numbers. And then based on those vectors, we can find if a user will like a movie. That's job done so far. But is, is this question something else? So I will come back to that. Um, so having said that, then that's this main idea of like three-step approach of doing collaborative filtering. So you can see now I can just read my movie again. So let's say uh, movies, I read my movie. I can say, this is my movie. These are the titles. Then we merge these movies with our ratings, which we already had table in the past. So you can now see, okay, movie 242 is actually this movie uh, and so on. And you can see there's all these different users that have seen this movie 242, and you can see what are the ratings they've given. So now I can use uh, fast AI to create my data loaders from, from data frame. So that's what this means. So collab data loaders from data frame, and I can pass in my data frame ratings. And this expects an item name. What does this item name mean? We, uh, it's just been mentioned here. By default, this uh, collaborative data loaders, oh, sorry. Uh, that should be fine. So it says by default, uh, the collaborative data loaders takes the first column of the user and it takes the second column for the item. It takes the second column for the item and the third column for the ratings. So 
that's what it says. First column is user, second column is item, and third column is rating, which is correct. But in movies, uh, what uh, we have done here is like, for the movies, instead of representing movies by IDs, in this case, we just represent movies by titles. So it's, it's more human readable. So you can see now I can just say dls.show batch, so you can see our batch. So let's just run this cell. There we go. We can see this is what our data loader looks like. You have a user, you have a title, and you have a rating. Cool. Um, you can check the classes in my data loaders. So if I say DLs classes, you can see I have however many users. I have 943 users. And it, the, number, the total number of users in our data loader is 944 because uh, we also have an extra user for all of those empty spots in our uh, basically the matrix and again the number of movies that we have is 1664 uh, because we again have an na so for all those users that have not seen movies then that movie is represented by ha hash na so that's just uh, an empty slot so in total you can see that's how my classes in my data loader looks like so you can get the number of users by saying length uh, number of classes and you just grab the user class you can get the number of users by doing this. And then uh, we just, in, in code, we, we're just doing what we did uh, in this uh, image, just in code, right? So I could just say, I want the number of latent factors to be five. So this is exactly that, one, two, three, four, five. So I can say, I want my number of latent factors to be five. So what's my, if I have, uh, again, this is a very uh, simple question. If I have, how many users do I have? Sorry and users and movies, right? We already know how many we have. I have 944 users, 1665 movies. So if I have 944 users, and then I wanna represent each user by a five length vector, then what's my user matrix? Like I could call, I could call this user matrix, right? So all of this could be my user matrix. And all of this could be my movie matrix, right? So I want to find the size of my user matrix. What would that be? How many users do I have? I have nine. Uh, I have 944 users and each user is five. So I'm going to have 944 by five. That's going to be my matrix size, right? So let's see. So I can say my user factors or my user matrix is gonna be n users times n factors. And my movie factors is gonna be number of movies times n factors. So we can, let's just check the shapes of these. So let's quickly check the shapes. User factors that shape, movie factors that shape. So you can see it's 944 by five and 1665 by five, because that's how many movies we have. All right, uh, so now, to calculate the result if a particular movie and between a particular movie and a user combination, what's the next thing we need to do? The next thing we need to do is we have to, we have to take a, a user, oh, sorry. We have to take, we have to take a user. That's not a good color for highlighting, one second. Uh, we have to take a user and we have to take the movie matrix and we have to multiply them right so uh if my users are represented in this 944 by 5 which means my first user is the first item my second user is the second item and my third user and so on is the third item and the 944th user is this 944th and similarly for movies i can represent my first movie and then i can represent my last movie so it's just uh that's just the matrix so if i want to check uh, what if, how much does the fifth user like the fifth movie? So I could just say user factors four, because um, that will index into the fifth item. So that's, that's the representation of my fifth user. And similarly, movie factors four. That's the representation. The second one is the representation of my fifth movie. Now I could multiply them and I could just calculate the sum. So that's how much is a score. That's how much. Uh, so that's like getting this, uh, that's like getting this prediction over here. We've just multiplied my user with the movie. 
so you can see how uh, we've just done what we shown what, what's being shown in this picture in code using torch using Python. So that's the idea. Um, one thing though uh, that I that I forgot to highlight but should be highlighted is in deep learning when when we're using PyTorch and when we want to uh, when we want to create like these user and movie matrices, I I could say oh we want to match the fifth user to the fifth movie so I could go user factors four so that gives me the fifth user and I could go movie factors four and that gives me the fifth movie. Um, the deep learning algorithm on its way does not have a way to index like it does not know that it, like the way these deep learning algorithms or like the way these forward functions in PyTorch modules work is like you can you can pretty much do matrix multiplication you can do uh, you can do your activation functions so that's why what happens is like you can you can just represent things by using one hot encode so what does that mean if I have however 944 users I can just one hot encode my users so this is just this is just like saying oh okay if I want to get the third user, so let's let's see. This is what it's that's that's what it's written here. So if I want to get the third user, uh, I can just represent the number of users, and I can one hot encode. So what does this give me? So let me show you the outputs. So you can see how if I do that, that just uh, that's just one at basically uh, because this is index three, that would be the fourth item. This is how Python indexing works. Like zero is the zero is the first item and three is the fourth item. So if I'm going to go and check my fourth user, then I could one hot encode, right? I could do it like this. Oh, sorry, one second. And I could multiply this with my user factors. So that would still give me Oh, sorry, that's an add rate, not multiply, matrix multiplication. These are factors not T at that expected sailor. Hmm. Oh, because I didn't say float. Okay. That should work. So this is just like the same as indexing so this is this is just this idea of don't worry and don't like you know don't think oh i don't understand this is when i tell you is like it's just another way of indexing the fourth item into my user factors like you can just index into the fourth item by doing this way of like using metrics multiplication but it's easier to do it this way or like it's it's more suitable to do it this way it's because that's how like these uh, underneath models have been implemented and then you can just pretty much grab the fourth item because metrics multiplication is really fast so that's this idea of from what i understand like that's this idea of uh, grabbing the grabbing the fourth item using metrics multiplication so you can just one hot encode all right um so you'll see this You'll, you'll see like all of that has been written here. But one thing is like, uh, when we're doing this movie and collaborative filtering and we're doing this movie recommendation, then this idea of like being able to, like all of this that uh, for the user, all, all of this that we've called, we've called it a matrix, but it's a special kind of matrix. What is it? It's, it's an embedding and embedding um so what is an embedding an embedding is just something you can index into in pytorch if you see nn dot embedding um you will see that this is just this idea of being able to represent things so it's just like a sim simple lookup table that stores embeddings of a fixed dictionary of size so what does that mean it's like you can represent this as a lookup table right so if i want to go and i want to uh, index, if I want to look up for user four, which is in index three, I could just represent that whole thing instead of like, uh, let me show it in code. So instead of representing my uh, user and I could just say my user and movies, I could just say nn.embedding. 
So that becomes my user factor. And then I could just grab the third item. It's not, sorry, I've made a mistake. That should have worked. Let's see. Toss the random, toss the tensor, get my embedding. Ah, uh, embedding dot weight. So then that becomes my, so that, that's just a, sim, a same way of doing things. Um, so anyway, so that's just a bit of a side note. It's like, these are what, um, this way of like representing my users like this and my movies like this, they, these is, this, this whole matrix is what is called an embedding matrix. So if you see this word embedding, don't worry, this is what it is. So it's just a, it's just a special layer that does indexing into this matrix using, the, using an integer. Um, and then because the last thing that should be looked into is that because we want to learn these things, right? And embedding, as we saw, if I show that, as you can see, an embedding has a gradient function. What does that mean? It means that now, because the, there's a gradient function over here, that just means that PyTorch can train these embeddings, right? So we want to learn these latent factors, which means we have to represent them as embeddings, which means because there's a gradient function on these embeddings, that just means that PyTorch can learn these embeddings. So as you can see, uh, that's just this main idea. And uh, that's that's pretty much that's all being represent that's all being said in, in this part of the section. It's like you can you can represent things by using an end dot embeddings as well. So I'll just see if there's any questions. How to decide how many latent factors do we need? That's a great question. Um, there's no particular answer. There's like there's no rule of thumb that I know of. But think of it this way: if you have, like, if you are going to represent a more complex thing, uh, then you would need a big number of latent factors. So what does that mean? So if you're trying to represent something that's really really complex, like in English, and this idea of like being able to represent things as numbers or as embeddings is, is not just uh, used in this, uh, in this part of like collaborative filtering or just for movies. It's also very much used in natural language processing. So, so words can be represented by embeddings as well. So if you think of it that way. Um, so like, if you're trying to represent a whole vocabulary of words as numbers, then because the vocabulary or English vocabulary, uh, English vocabulary is really massive, then you need like a bigger embedding matrix size, which is like the typical number 768 or like that, that's just the number of latent factors. But if you're trying to represent something really small, in which case, which is uh, movies and, and users, and it's not really very complex and there's like less number of movies and less number of users. In that case, you can say like an embedding matrix could be 50, but the, there's no, straight answer that I have for like how many latent factors do we need. But uh, I hope what I've said is like, it depends on the complexity, like the more complex thing you're trying to represent, the more number of latent factors you would need. So the next thing is, let's say a restaurant predicting food on customer's preference, what will be used to predict for customer similar to rating for movies? Uh, well, for if you, let's say for a restaurant for predicting food based on customer preference. Yeah, so, so you could have customers uh, rate like different kinds of food, right? So then your food becomes the movies and your customers remain the customers. So then now you know which customer likes what kind of food. So then that restaurant, whichever is doing the prediction, then that restaurant can find users that would like a particular type of food. So I hope that makes sense. But that's just, but this idea of like having recommendation is not just, uh, useful to movies, but it can be used in like any other kind of problem. So that's that. Uh, so now let's do our collaborative filtering from scratch. One thing we haven't done or should be like, I'm assuming everybody would know is like object oriented programming. So uh, in Python, you have things as classes, you have dunder units, which is your definitions and you can have methods. I won't go into the details of this, this pretty much 
written here, like a very small blurb that's been written here. But you could have a class, then you can have an instance of that class, and you can call a method on that. So uh, I won't go into the much details on like what this object-oriented programming is. Again, that's uh, what's been mentioned in the book as well, is that we would recommend looking up for a tutorial and get, getting more practice before moving on. But uh, I will tell you the main idea is like, if I'm trying to create now my model, so far we haven't really created models from scratch, right? So if I want to create this, if I want to create a model that can do a movie recommendation, then what would I need? I would need two things. I would need my user matrix, which is called an embedding, and I would need my movie matrix, which is again a movie embedding, right? Those are the two things that I would need. So let's see. That's what's happening here is like I add my user factors as an embedding. So as you can see, now this is an embedding. What does that mean? It means it can be learned. So these latent factors, they can be learned. And then what's the size of my user embedding going to be? It's going to be however many users I have. So number of users time number of factors. So if I have like 944 users, then it's going to be 944 times however many factors I choose. It could be five, it could be 50. So that's just the number of latent factors. Similarly, for my movies, I can define this embedding. Uh, and then I can just say, what's my embedding size going to be? It's going to be how many movies I have times the number of factors. So I can just store it in self. So those are the two things that become. And then in PyTorch, when you're defining custom models, so defining, I just want to show you PyTorch uh, NN module. So these are the things you would have to look at if you want to understand uh, everything that's going on over here. It's like, go have a look at what this means. It's like torch.nn module. In PyTorch, everything is an instance of this nn.module. And then you can, uh, you pretty much define a forward method which defines what this model does, okay? Uh, so if I wanna get the predictions, I can grab the user, uh, I can grab the movie. So uh, I can pretty much grab this user in red and I can grab the movie over here. And then I can just multiply it and sum it. And that would give my prediction score, right? But in this case, uh, when I was doing my data loader, so let's do that. Uh, I can grab my data loader. You can see I have my data loader shape is path size of 64, and then it has two columns. So let's go back and let me show you what was in the data loader. So you can see how uh, I want to actually explain what goes on in the data loader. I shouldn't have to, but I will still do it. Um, in my data loader, my number of rows, sorry, that's not a good color. Hmm. Don't know why my one note is playing up. Won't let me select the, all right, let me restart this app. That work. That works. Yeah, that works. Cool. Uh, so in in my data loader, basically, the number of rows or becomes my batch size, right? And then I have two columns. My first column is for my user, and my second column is for my movies, right? So that's why if I go and have a look at uh, where is this? If I grab my first batch from my data loader, uh, which is X and Y, I can see, I can see that the X dot shape is 64 by two, and then the Y dot shape is 64, which means I grab 64 users in my data loader. I grab 64 movies from my data loader, and I have 64, predictions or scores or, or basically ratings, which becomes my Y. So my X is two columns, right? Which is my user and my movie. So the first column becomes, uh, so this X, this X over here 
the first column, if I go and grab all the rows and I grab the first column, you can see like these are the these are the user indexes because the first column is the user, right? And then similarly, I can grab my second column. So these these becomes the movie IDs, and then I can see my Ys. So you can see these become the scores. So how do I interpret this? User six seventy seven saw the movie one zero three eight ID and gave a score or rating of one. User 655 saw the movie 699 and gave a score of three. User 178 saw the movie 1174 and gave a score of four, okay? So that's how I would interpret my data loader. So as you can see, now what gets passed to my model is like this data loader. So I can grab all my users by indexing into my user matrix, passing in the user IDs. Remember, X zero was just my user IDs, right? So I can grab my, what does this mean? So my user IDs were, uh, so if my, if my say my user IDs were these ones, three, 932, 389, 360, then I could go into this uh, embedding matrix, which is this massive long, the embedding matrix, and I can grab the elements of 360, 980, and so on. So these, these are my particular user users that I want to grab. And then I can just multiply these users with my movies and I can grab the scores. I wouldn't, I shouldn't, I wouldn't have gone into the details of how like PyTorch data loaders work or how this module work, but I just still didn't want to give you guys a glimpse of like what exactly is going on over here. So uh, if this part, just in case, like what I've explained so far, doesn't make sense, you want to spend some more time on PyTorch data loaders and you want to spend some more time on PyTorch NN.module. So uh, then, because this is my uh, model, which is just multiplying my user latent factors with my movie latent factors, which is happening here, uh, I can just define my model like that, where my number of users is n users, number of movies is n movies, and latent factors is 50. Then I can just use the PyTorch data loader. Sorry, one second. Then I can just use the PyTorch uh, learner passing in these data loaders. And I can call fit one cycle. So you can see now this model is going to start to learn. Like it, it's going to start those. What, what the model is particularly learning, it's learning the uh, latencies. It's learning these latent factors and it's learning these latent factors. So it's learning latent factors about movies and it's learning, learning latent factors about users. So you can see how now my valid loss is going down. It started at 1.27 and it's going down to 1.12. Sorry, one second. Okay, uh, let's see if there's any questions. Uh, we haven't talked about PCA, Kevin. That's coming later. Um, so now that's just my model, right? I, I do hope like I'm trying to, I'm trying my best to make sure that we all understand how this works in PyTorch, but there's only so much that I can do is like, try and explain only so much of the code. The rest of that would come from practice. So the more you write this code, the more you understand. But I can explain like the main concept. So like I can explain the main things that are happening in that in, in these particular pieces of code. So now if you wanna make our model better, right? Right now, all we've done is like, we, we took our uh, user embedding, we took our movie embedding, we multiplied between them and we got all of these scores. Then we calculated the loss and that's how our model is training, right? But we haven't done anything to like improve this model or make this model any better. So if you want to make this model any better, one thing we can do is we can make sure that the predictions are between range zero and five, right? Because when you multiply two matrices or you multiply two vectors, uh, the numbers or the, the output could be any could, could be any value because like we, we don't control what the values of this embedding matrix are. So the one thing we can do is like, we can use the sigmoid range function. We saw the sigmoid range function in the, I think that was the second or the third chapter. It pretty much makes things 
uh, be in this in the range that we want it to be. So we can make all predictions be in the range zero and five, and you can train a model again. So you can see how that's happening. Uh, finally, then what you want to do is we can try and improve this model even a bit more. So the if you want to improve this model even more, let me again uh, copy paste that nice image. All right, so if you want to improve this model even more, something we haven't really considered so far is like some users are just, they hate to give good ratings, right? Like even if a user likes the movie, that user would give a bad rating. Like some, some users are like that, right? Some users go to a restaurant, they love the food, but when it comes to giving rating to that restaurant, they'll still rate it eight, but not 10. And that's that's something that unfortunately is very, uh, that's out there. And then some users like to give good ratings. Like some users would hate the restaurant or some users would hate the movie, but they would, they would still say, oh, I love the movie. And the rating is like 10. So you know what I mean? Like that's just the personality of that user. And this particular thing is called as bias. So one thing we can do is like for each of the users, I can add this one number. So which is called bias. And similarly, I can add a bias for each of my movies, so on. Um, what this bias means is like, even if a user likes action movies, even if a user likes musical movies and then the movie is everything that the user likes in even then the user is going to give the movie a bad rating similarly when it comes to the movies even if the like the movie is has everything that the user wants the movie is still this like the direction of it is is just the way the camera was used or like even if there's like a lot of music, maybe the music is of a different kind. What I'm trying to say is like, it's still possible that the movie is not a good movie, right? So we have to consider this idea of bias for both our users and for both, uh, for both users and movies. And that's what we do next. We add this new model, which we call dot product bias. We define a user bias. We define a movie bias. And then when we are calculating our result, we just add the user bias and we add the movie bias to our final result. And now our result is still in the sigmoid range. So we can still train this model. So that's, that's what happens. Um, that's that. I mean, that's just the, that's just uh, what we've done so far. The next thing we want to do is like, if you want to make things even better or we want to, uh, like we want to now still make this model better. There's this idea called weight decay that we can add. It's a very general idea. It's not uh, specific to collaborative filtering at all. For, for weight decay, you can add weight decay to any of, uh, any of the models that you've trained so far. So even in cassava, if you feel like your model is overfitting, try adding weight decay to it. Now, what is this weight decay? In weight decay, what you do is like you add the parameters of the model and you add the square of those parameters or, or the square of those weights to your loss function. So what does that mean? What's that gonna do? What's that gonna do is like, uh, let me actually just explain what I've just said. So I have my, this is my model and this model has some weights, right? So let's say my loss so far is binary cross entropy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add the square of these weights to my loss function. And I'm going to multiply that by say some factor, so 0 0.01. So it's gonna be 0 0.99 times binary cross entropy, and it's gonna be 0 0.01 times the weight squared. This idea of like adding the weights squared to the, to the loss is called as weight decay. And the reason we want to do that is like, if there's higher weights, then that just means that your parabola or like your loss function is going to have 
very sharp curves and we don't want our parabola or we don't want our basically we don't want our loss function to have very sharp curves so it's like if you see this parabola and if the value is like because the parabola is represented by ax squared plus bx plus c that's like just the equation of the parabola um if the weights are really high then instead of the loss being really flat it just the curvature becomes really really sharp and then that becomes really hard for the model to train. So the idea behind adding weight decay is like we keep the model parameters to be a small value. And then by making sure that the model parameters are small value, we are kind of making sure that a loss function is smooth and that we are able to train our network. So if in, in fast AI, if you want to add weight decay, you just say to my learner, like I can still use the same dot product bias model that we have. Uh, I could just say WD equals 0.1. And then I can just create my learner and I can just fit, fit one cycle. And you can see then the valid loss was actually much lower than what we got over here. So we got 0.89 valid loss. Uh, but in the previous run, the valid loss after adding weight decay was like 0.82. So that's just this idea of like adding weight decay. Uh, next step is we, we're, using, uh, we're using this idea of like embedding. So what we're gonna do now in this is like, this is again, digging deep more into PyTorch. And what we're going to do in part of this is like, we're going to create our own embedding matrix. Uh, but I'll take a break and like, just look at some questions. If there are any questions, so no questions. All right. Um, so I'll continue with the embedding module. So, uh, when it comes to creating our own embedding modules, remember with an embedding matrix, what I want to do is like, this becomes my user embedding matrix. And then this at the top becomes my movie embedding matrix, right? And I already told you that the difference between an embedding matrix and just a, a standard matrix is the fact that embedding matrix can be learned. Sorry, one second. Um, so the fact that the embedding matrix can be learned, right? And uh, in PyTorch, if you wanna make things, if you wanna define things such that they can be learned, in PyTorch, you wanna define them to be parameters. So if, uh, if, if you see how I have my, if I can define like my PyTorch module as, I just call my PyTorch model as T and I define uh, some variable or like some, sorry, some uh, self.a, which is, which, is uh, which, which is not a parameter. And I just assign that to my model. So this is just a dummy model. You can see that the value of parameters of this model is zero. There's, there's no such thing in the parameters. And in PyTorch, when there's nothing in the parameters, that just means that the parameters can't be trained. So I, I mean, there's no training going to happen inside the model. So I want to show you, and then you want to have a look at, for this part of the section, uh, you want to go back and have a look at uh, PyTorch nn.parameter. Uh, so if you want to define things such that they are trained, like if I want to define my embedding matrix over here, and if I want to define my movie matri embedding matrix over here, and I want to make sure that they are trained and that the model learns their values on their own, instead of I defining them like nn.embedding, I could just say nn.parameter. So in any time I define something instead of it being touched at once, anytime, anytime I wrap something in nn.parameter, PyTorch knows that that's the one thing I have to train or that's the one thing I have to learn. So you can see now I can see that if I wrap this uh, self.a in nn.parameter, you can see that now it is uh, a tensor, not only a tensor, but it also says requires grad equals two, which means that when we're doing stochastic gradient descent or when we're calculating the gradients, the gradients of this parameter self.a would be calculated and that the model uh, that this is the thing that could be learned inside the model, right? So if you want to create our own, uh, similarly, when you define things like nn.linear, which is just a matrix. Uh, so nn.linear, if I want to define in, in PyTorch, if I want to define a matrix, which is of say 50 users and 50 rows, and then it's by five, 50 by five, I could just say 
nn dot linear 50 by 5. And then you can check the shape uh, dot weight dot shape. It's it's five five by fifty because it just takes the transpose of that. Like that's just how the weight is represented. So I could have just said that. So you can see how it's like fifty by five shape. So if I want to say things like that, now in our dot product bias, instead of like using nn dot embedding, I can just wrap my things inside nn dot parameter, right? So I can say for my user factors or like for my for my basically my users create my parameters such that they are trained you initialize them with parse the zeros uh you you pass in the size and then this normal is just going to initialize those values to be a normal distribution between zero and point zero one so i just do that i define my user latent uh, my user latent matrix, my movie latent matrix which is instead of now using nn dot embedding it's the same idea uh, I define my user bias, I define my movie bias, and now I can train this model. I'll create params, it's not defined, I just need to run this down. Um, so that's just this main idea of like being able to learn and train uh, all of these different parts of like creating parameters, what, what's a PyTorch parameter, what's a PyTorch module, and like how you can create your own parameters inside your own custom models. And then how can you train those custom models so that all of that has been mentioned now in this chapter. So this is uh, where we'll stop today, but I will take any questions that you might have. About about matrices or like anything you want to anybody wants to ask about any dot embeddings or any dot parameters, otherwise we'll continue next week about interpreting these embeddings and biases. Okay, um, so there's no questions today, so uh, I guess that's where we'll end. Um, thanks everybody for joining and I'll see you guys next week.